Hello, I'm your host Jim McLean. Welcome back to another episode of More Than Pixels on a Screen, a podcast brought to you by the Banterflix Movie Review website. This episode is the first of two specials dedicated to the Render Festival. It's going to be happening here in Belfast on the 23rd and the 24th of February at the Portview Trade Centre here in the city. There's going to be over 30 guests in attendance with professionals from the film, television, gaming, animation industries, all here sharing their passion and knowledge about what they do. I reckon it's going to be an absolutely fantastic lineup and an absolutely fantastic two days. So whether you are already in the industry, you're looking to get into the industry or just have a passion for popular culture, I'm sure there's going to be something there for everybody. Thanks to the organisers, I'm delighted to say that we got a chance to speak to two of the guests. On this episode, I'm going to be speaking with artist Giovanna Ferrari. She's been working in the film industry now for several years. She's most notable to me for her work with Irish animation studio Cartoon Saloon, who've created the likes of The Song of the Sea, Secret of Kells, Wolf Walkers, more recently My Father's Dragon. But one film in particular from their back catalogue that Giovanna worked on was The Breadwinner, which I absolutely love. So I was delighted to get the chance to talk to her about the film but also reflect on her career as well but before you hear that interview let's play a clip of the breadwinner i need to find a way to see my baba you can have mine if you like i don't want him my father was taken to prison and we've heard nothing of him since they won't let you see him perwana but i'm a boy now it doesn't make a difference they'll keep him or let him go but there's nothing you could do about it you don't know that i'm sorry It's just the way it is. So that's a clip of The Breadwinner, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Giovanna Ferrari, who's one of the storyboard artists and uh, animators on that project. And I know you've worked on quite a few features, Giovanna, but The Breadwinner is something that I absolutely adore, and we will come back to that. But I'm just going to get that over with straight away, that I absolutely adore The Breadwinner. And I mean, I know that Cartoon Saloon has done quite a few projects, and I know more recently, you've gone more recent projects, but that's one that is holds a special place for me. But I have introduced yourself. Do you want to tell our, our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yes. Yeah, so I am. Um, I was born in, in Italy and I worked in across Europe, more or less um, um, everywhere. And then uh, I landed uh, in Cartoon Saloon uh, in 2015, even though I had already worked with them. Uh, uh, so I'm going to see, um, but remotely. So I was an animator on Sangre Sea and uh, had a big chance to work uh, on a lot of shots with the Sir Shah, who at the time was the same age of my daughter. So it was very nice to to animate a character that looked so much like my kid. And uh, and then I uh, was asked to come to Kilkenny to work and I moved here um, with my daughter. And uh, yes, I had a great amazing opportunity of uh, storyboarding and animating on Breadwinner. That was uh, really the reason why I moved was not only Cartoon Saloon, but also obviously Nora Toomey was amazing to be working with her. Um, For me, it was the first time I got to uh, work with a female director and it was a new experience um, that I really wanted to do. And especially the theme of the movie was so... uh, absolutely important and unique and uh, yeah I, I couldn't say no <laughs> I as I said at the start I mean I I adore the breadwinner um it was a, a film I seen at the Glasgow Film Festival and I remember it was a very dusty cinema screening because mm-hmm. there was a lot of things there was a lot of dust in my eye that's all I can say <laughs> uh, anybody who listens to this podcast will know that I am someone who cry who can cry at the drop of a hat but that film kind of really got to me. And I mean, I mean, I'm a massive fan of Cartoon Saloon's back catalogue because it's they've just kind of come from Ireland. They're an Irish based company. And of course, they've just taken over the world with their yes. style. But look, you mentioned a few things there, Giovanna. I want to come back, you know, starting out. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you kind of started out within the within the industry before I suppose we kind of get to uh, Cartoon Saloon. I, I was kind of looking through IMDb, I think it was around 2007, I think was your first credited 
uh, on your first credited kind of on on, on IMDb. I don't know how yeah. truthful or not that is, but uh, <laughs> take us back to that kind of pre cartoon saloon starting out within the within within the industry and kind of how you've seen, I suppose, yourself progress. So I started really actually very early. The first time I worked in animation, I was I think eighteen or nineteen. I had just finished high school. Um, I worked for for a very short time. I went to uni and I went to a sem- basically to a philosophy or semiology, semiotics uh, course that was invented by Umberto Eco that was in the city where I lived because there was no animation school at the time at all. So I did a bit of that. I really loved it, but it wasn't my thing. And I really wanted to animate. I really wanted to draw and work in cinema. And uh, that was what I really wanted to do since I was a child. And yeah, Was there I mean, anything, Giovanna, that just from around that time that, you watch that would have influenced you anything you drew inspiration from that that did inspire you to become and that this was from such an early age that this is the career you wanted to pursue so yes when i was a kid there was a lot of um, japanese animation in italy uh, but it was very good there was a lot of stuff from uh, even studio ghibli or uh, there were so many beautiful projects and uh also um there still, there still was a lot of old old disney in the cinemas for for children. I used to screen them even if they were like 20 years old. So I grew up really with uh, between with really 2D drawn animation. But the thing that I was doing when I, and I'm, I'm talking about me, maybe six years old, seven. So mm-hmm. very, very young. Um, because the main characters in the series I was watching usually were, first of all, series were daily or weekly. So you couldn't binge them. So, you know, they was finished, like it would end of the episode, then you have to wait. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't. So what would I, what would I do? I would go in my room and keep drawing it. <laughs> I would draw the next episode or the next bit of the story. Sometimes I would draw another episode from a point of view of another character because mainly they were male characters Mm -hmm. and I wanted to actually, and there was never a character for me that was actually, you know, that that, that was looking like me. So I really wanted to, to, to draw it. So I I would do these things that now look like storyboards, actually, (laughs) that were continuations of the, of the episode or the movie I had watched, or maybe... I'm intrigued to ask, I mean, I'm sorry to cut across, I'm intrigued to ask, you know, if you're doing that week to week, if you're creating your own story, what happens if the story you've created is better than the episode the next week? It often was. I don't know. I was so young. They were probably crap. <laughs> no. <laughs> they were funny. It was fun. I don't. I don't remember them. They mm. would go somewhere else they would really be fun full of fantasy uh but that that's that is really what started this um for me the idea oh my god i love to do this i really want to do this i was very picky as well um i really didn't like animation that was uh so cheap that you would have a layer for the face and then the mouth just doing blah 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 this lip sync i i really didn't like it Mm. and i couldn't watch those things because i i thought you can draw that. <laughs> you can stretch and squash the face. It looks much better. So yeah, I was picky. <laughs> I, I wondered, would you be the type of person then? Because the only reason I bring this up is because we actually do a regular podcast where we've been doing a retrospective about the old Disney movies and kind of okay. the dark era. We've just recently been talking about the Black Cauldron and things like that. And that sense that would you be someone even from a young age, would you have noticed animators reusing? Yes, absolutely. Anim- absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I absolutely noticed, and I was, I, I figured it out. I was like, yeah, of course, they use the same, the, the same uh, rough or anyway, the same first pass because it, it's obviously the same, uh, the same animation. I, I, yeah, yeah, I was very, very yeah. attuned. Then, uh, um, obviously, when I was older, I think my biggest influence was Miyazaki's uh, Princess Mononoke. That, that is for me still to today, like probably the best movie ever done when once i were talking with with tom Moore about it and we both were saying like sometimes we, we watch that movie and then you think why we, would we do any other movie after that one i mean there is already that one that should suffice <laughs> 
but we have to. We we have to reach to go on, and everybody always kind of wants to do anything. But but take me. I mean, we're talking there about very young. Can you remember kind of what was the first project? Your first official credit? Yes. Then and, I went. I went on and started to work on. Uh, I really was just assisting and doing in betweens in uh, for a very small company that was in the city where I was while I was waiting to do a school. So for a couple of years, I've been just uh, in betweening and uh, yeah, very very simple animating. On paper, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking good old paper times. And then I went to school for three years uh, in a school that was just opened and was still uh, a bit wonky at the time. It was great because there was a lot of creativity involved. You could do whatever you wanted, basically. But it was uh, still a bit uh, rough on the edges. Well, now it's a, it's a great, uh, great institution. And um, when I finished, I then actually, yes, moved to France pretty immediately. And I went to Angoulême and I started to work for Prima Linea. And I worked on Père du Noir, uh, which is called in English Fears of the Dark. Um, and there I met a lot of amazing artists and in not only animators, but also illustrators. So, you know, Mattotti, um, Blotch. Um, there were a list of them that was uh, it was incredible to be just in the same room with this incredible artist and uh, the supervisors there were all ex Disney's so they were incredibly talented and uh, they taught me so much obviously I was very young and then I proceeded to stick around another while and then I went to, to Paris at this point uh, I was pregnant and uh and then, uh, and then it was yeah. That those were hard times because um, the industry was really contracting. Um, it was around two thousand and eight, so the economical crisis was there. It was a, a weird moment as well because CGI was really um, ramping up. A lot of productions were trying in Europe, at least, they were trying three D and were going that way. So there was a lot of investment in three D even when it wasn't necessary <laughs> in a way. Um, so it, it was very hard to find jobs because uh, anytime you would, you know, start to look for something, production was already closed because all the best animators in the world were were there and they, and, and it was very, very tough to compete. So that actually forced me to go to storyboard, to really move into storyboard because uh, animation was so hard to get because 2D animation was so limited at that time. So I started to do storyboard as well um, because for storyboard, you can work for 3D, you can work for 2D, you can work for everything. So I started to work for a series um, and I had a lot of fun actually on a BBC series that was called um, 64 Zulane. It was a preschool uh, little series, but I loved it because it was still on paper, everything. And I had my baby, <laughs> so I, I used to work from home and um, I really learned a lot about blocking, about storyboarding, about storytelling, about reading a script, about very ABC rules of storyboarding because I wasn't, it wasn't difficult to draw. It was just a lot of thinking. Yeah. And, uh, and that was really, I learned so much on that production. I'm really thankful for that uh, experience. And then, uh, um, and then I started to, to work also for abroad. So I went uh, to Luxembourg a couple of times. I worked on uh, on Pinocchio with Mattotti, who I'd already met in Angoulême before. Um, and then uh, I worked on some other projects from Prima Linea. I was an uh, assistant director briefly for like a year or something on uh, a project that then was re re um, restarted in another city. But the first chunk of pre-production, I was assistant director of Mattotti on uh, um, the famous invasion of the bears in Sicily. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I worked on um, on song, and then so many other little projects yeah. everywhere. <laughs> it's hard to remember them all. I'm I'm curious, and I know it's it's probably a silly question. You talked there about kind of starting out working on paper. How mm -hmm. much has the industry you're working in now changed in that time period? Now we we're 2023. Uh, we're going to mean the the most recent project, I suppose, my father's dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I know you've maybe worked. You're maybe on working something since then, but working on a project like that, I don't know. It's a silly question, but just how far has that industry from from storyboarding to animation in that time period? How how far has it come, and how far has it changed? Um, it depends. It depends on the company. It depends on the project. Some projects are now really extremely 
technically speaking, made in completely different ways. Apart from, to be honest, the storyboards are really always kind of the same. Like mm. storyboards, you can do them on a piece of paper. You can do them on, uh, usually uh, we use, people use either Photoshop or uh, Toon Boom Storyboard Pro, which is really the, the basic instrument. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, now a lot of people use other programs to do it, 3D programs to do it. Um, but in a way, it doesn't change much, um, storyboarding. Um, what has changed a lot is animation, but because you can, if you do 3D projects, you can really go like then you, you can use so many other tools. But for us, like I think what made really Cartoon 7 stronger and what made them survive is that they, they when this period in 2008 of 3D CGI, let's go all in with computers, um, they chose another way. They 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 chose the contrary. They they went like, okay, you know what? What can we do with what we have instead? <laughs> what if we, instead of trying to copy Pixar and Disney, what if we try to do something that we actually can do and is what we like and looks like us? And that was a winning, a winning game. Absolutely. They, they nailed it. That, that was really, and when I saw them starting to do that, I was in France and uh, I was, I was in awe. I was like, yes, the resistance. <laughs> yes. That's what, and I really was um, following them and in love with this idea of instead of trying to copy America, doing something that was so alien to us um, and having to get everybody to relearn the job to instead really hone into our own specific skills. And I think that in this case, going back to technology, um, 2D animation has some very amazing new tools. We use now, you know, TV Paint, for instance, which is, or even Blender, uh, if used in 2D, which it's really like like drawing. It's but it's the same as drawing on a on a paper. It's just easier because it's easier to erase. You don't have the problem with the, you know, you, you can control Z everything. You can save products. You can uh, absolutely. The, the best thing is being able to press a button and seeing your animation, which is yeah. so different from before. You know, I. I just want to pick up because you've talked quite a bit. You've talked about 2D and you've mentioned 3D. And I'm always, I mean, I'm not a massive fan personally of, of 3D cinema. I think it's come a long way. I mean, just recently I went to see Titanic, which I know has been re-released in 3D. James Cameron's very project, uh, very passionate about that project. I know he's very passionate about 3D technology in cinema. I think it's come a long way from kind of the, the pokey, pokey, approach that we would have seen kind of particularly in the 80s which was used in a lot of horror movies and it was a gimmick it's come a long way and i think some places i've definitely seen it being used beautifully is in 3d is in 3d animation you know in that sense of it's giving texture and it's being used to kind of create kind of enrich the image i suppose is the best way i can think about it this evening as i talk to you but just your thoughts on 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 3d and that sense of how much of a challenge was that i mean have you worked on many 3d projects and having to adapt your style and to, to, to that to that kind of new that technology um so i never animated in 3d um never and uh, i i really don't think i would love to because what i really like doing when i animate is drawing so if you take away that from me i just probably will hate my job <laughs> <laughs> I don't do it, but um, storyboarding, as I said before, 3D or 2D is very similar. The thing I feel with 3D is that you have to respect boundaries in a way that you don't have to respect in 2D in the sense that um, there are some technicalities like, you know, uh, reading the way you project scenes, you have assets you have to take care of. Um, while 2D, again, to me, it gives you so much more freedom to actually, you know, every scene you can draw it, you do whatever you have to do. Um, obviously, it's, it's cheaper, I guess, to have one model for everything rather than having to draw everything every time. But as a storyboard artist, a 3D can be, in my opinion, uh, less fun um, mm. for that. Um, and again, it depends really on the project because then there are projects I, I didn't work on, but I really love, like, um, uh, I lost my body short movie that mm -hmm. really used utilizes 3d see that's a thing as well like when you use 3d for a reason because the story you're telling needs 3d and in that case 
frankly, like it would have been much a nightmare to do uh, that movie in 2D. Then, then it, it it then it blooms. Then it makes sense. Then you see why why it's like that. It's it's always the same story. Like the medium you choose has to make sense with what you're saying. So it's not even a matter of of what technical technical tools can do to you mm-hmm. or for you. It's much more about um, is my story needing what what does my story need? Because at the end of the day, what is important about any movie is the story. It's it that's it. Yeah. No, no, you 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 are completely correct, and and it's that's I mean that that's not just an animation. It's generally I mean. If, I mean, the 3D kind of way resurgence has kind of come and kind of went away again. And I know kind of 3D IMAX is kind of a thing. I don't know. It's that sense of, but it, it's whether the film actually needs it. But it, I guess from my point of view, it's that sense. Of, I think the technology has moved to how they've used it. But I want I want to come back to a few things, Giovanna, you mentioned early on. Uh, you mentioned your daughter and you, know, you mentioned with the breadwinner. And, and I... If, if I wanted to, and if I allowed myself, we could go off and probably talk for hours about that film, but we will not. We will not. I would just say, anybody listening to this, see if you haven't seen it, seek it out. It is a, a beautiful film, and I know I've said that, but what do you, from your storyboarding and your animation, you mentioned kind of your daughter, what, what do you draw from? What, what What's your influences that you draw from, and kind of that has influenced your style that you have, and I suppose bringing that, that style to Cartoon Saloon, because they have a very kind of, they mm. have a very particular style in their own sense that, of of their animation. Yes. Um, I use, so- as, as always, Jeff, and I, I ask about three questions in one <laughs> and just let you go. That's my usual style. I'll ask about three or four questions in one and just expect you just to roll with it. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's really, it's a very, very good question. Um, it's really good. So, um, Kitchen Saloon has, um, as you say, a very specific um, style. And the humans be- human beings in Kitchen Saloon are very, very open to to discussion. There's a lot of cooperation and um whether you are working with Nora to me or with uh, Tamor, with Paul Young or with Ross Stewart, it doesn't really matter now, like with Louise Bagno, uh, they all are um, very open. And uh, it's really the idea that, we, you know, you throw, each, you throw each other's idea and you talk and then at the end, you don't even know who whose idea was in the first place. <laughs> like I don't know, <laughs> whatever. It's a lasagna of good ideas. <laughs> I like that idea. I'm going to steal that phrase, a lasagna of good. If I take anything from talking to yourself this evening, I am going to steal a lasagna of ideas. You've, I don't know, that might be a Giovanni original. Giovanni, that might be originally you, but idea. if it's not, um, I, I am going to take that from this interview. I use that metaphor for everything, by the way. It's kind of, it's a las- it kind works. Of thing of many things. <laughs> it works. It works. <laughs> so, but what I, but in the, the good things, I, I think we all bring to the table <clears throat> something completely different. So Tom, for instance, has this uh, very um, artistic uh composition visual composition ideas like he really has a, a sense of his drawings are amazing compositions always um and he has he, he, he nails it <laughs> he just does it like that easy peasy i can go i can i i'm not gonna quote everybody's like nora for is an amazing editor and not only she's an amazing actress and she has a sense of um of of of, of cinematic editing that is incredible and it's really like she, you could give her a camera and tell her go and make a movie a, a live action movie and that would be a great movie because mm-hmm. she really has this uh, cinematic view um what i do what i bring to the table most of the times is really um a perspective on story on um subtext on uh, almost semiotics um on how to use you know really tools on what understanding how to express the message through the drawing so to me a canvas a drawing a storyboard panel is basically a way i have to um to tell the audience something i'm not telling them in the script so i use every tool i have in the image to actually convey a subtext 
you know. Show it, don't it, tell. Show don't exactly. tell. That, that, that the old one of the oldest ideas of cinema. Show me, don't tell me. And it's also really something I I try to go. Uh, I try to use tricks um, to to go into the subconscious mine and of others so that uh, my I try really to create storyboards or sequences in which there are symbols behind every drawing that you if everything works correctly you will know they're there but yeah could, could I ask you <laughs> could I push you maybe, maybe you don't want to be pushed in that sense but like say for instance even on something more recent like my, my father's dragon or even the aforementioned breadwinner projects like that is there anything in particular or any that, that comes to mind when you mention that idea and that kind of of of, of the importance of the image that you would say to our listeners tonight say if they're watching either of those there's one scene in particular to, to look out for well, I, I know it's I, have, I know it's Sophie's choice, but you know there's a, I'm sure there's a lot. But just some, I guess, just something that comes to your mind as we speak. Um, literally every storyboard I have personally storyboarded as that. So uh, the, the 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 easiest thing that comes to mind is is a is a sequence in Breadwinner where where Parvana enters the house her house for the first time, where literally every shot exists for for reasons that are often not. Um, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't know why, <laughs> mm. um, but they are behind. So there's a way to introduce characters without, without actually, like in a very peculiar way. You gotta watch it. If I have, like, I do actually one of my talks, and uh, I will certainly talk about this in uh, uh, at Render Festival. Uh, is literally about the blocking of that sequence because. Um, in in choosing certain cameras, you really are making choices about what you're actually saying, like, you know, um, you're, what you're not saying sometimes is more important than what you're saying. So, yeah, I, it's hard just to nail it down to one scene without going on for an hour. <laughs> just just to kind of very quickly, maybe I'm just from listening to yourself there, are there cinematographers that you can, we, we've talked kind of a lot about kind of other artists, but is there cinematographers that you have that are working in the industry now that you look at? Yes. That are that are influences for yourself as well. Yes, my favorite cinematographer is Ari Wagner. Mm. The Power of the Dog is one of our uh, of our movies. Um, yes, it, it's funny that you mentioned cinematography because very few people actually, and actually, I didn't know when I was young that it's very similar the job of the storyboard artist and the job of the, of the cinematographer. I love, I, I would have loved to do that. Like if I had to, a chance to live another life, I would uh, try to be a cinematographer next time. Because <laughs> I think it's I'm sure. I'm sure you don't need to live another life. I'm sure you could get a chance as a cinematographer. The, the industry's changing. You know, I, I, wa I, I want to ask you that in that sense. And you mentioned earlier on that you wanted to work with, uh, with Nora because she's a female director. I mean, what is the... And I, I'm very conscious. I, I'm the man sitting in the room here chatting. But what is the representation like within your industry, within your side, your strand of the industry? What, how do you find that? I mean, is it kind of we, we talk about looking for representation now? Um, what is that like, kind of currently for you and your experience in the industry? It has changed a lot in the last uh, twenty years. Uh, when I started uh, in animation, I was always practically the only girl in the room. Yeah. And it wasn't easy and it wasn't fun. And we didn't have the language or the we didn't have the vocabulary to to talk about what it meant for women and for men to, you know, to do this new thing <laughs> that was working together. Um it, it's been it's been tough, I think, for everybody. And uh, but it 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 has changed a lot. Um it obviously, yeah, we all know Me Too really helped. Yeah. And I think that the re the thing that helped the most was really to give a name to things to be able to, you know, to, to, to actually pin them down to an, a, a word rather than, you know, having to explain every time the specific situation you were going through, the difficulty, I don't know if I'm crazy, am I feeling this, is it true? Now you have an, a word for it, you know, it's mansplaining or whatever it is. Mm. Finally, you can, we can talk about it and and that's where things are really started to, to, to get better. Cartoon Saloon, I have to say, was really early in, in this. Also, you know, Nora being one of the founders, um, she's a mother, 
And uh, I found it really hard in my career, the beginning to work as a mom, as a woman, and as a and and also as a as a stranger because I was never like you know I always worked abroad. Um, it was difficult. But in Cartoon Saloon, there was a sense of familiarity. They all had kids. Tom had a, a child very young, so there were kids roaming around all the time, and it <laughs> it really felt like they, their their idea was well, if you. A person with family needs to be able to work. So, you know, the work environment has to accommodate the fact that people have lives, which is really actually the thing that makes it possible for so many women in animation to work in Cartoon Saloon, because that is something that I haven't seen anywhere else where, you know, um, your kid comes out of school at three. Well, your kid will be at your desk for between three and seven o'clock at night. Okay. Like, you know, that's how it is. I would have never dreamt of doing it in France, I think. Uh, while, yeah, Cartoon Saloon allowed me to do it. And, you know, there were many kids. <laughs> now there are a lot of babies. And now I have to say, I think we are equally women and men. Uh, the production I'm working on right now, absolutely, there are more um, women than men. And uh there is a lot of we have a lot of we're starting now to have a, a good representation also of uh, you know LGBTQ plus mm. uh, communities. There's not only male and female. There's also a lot of other stuff as well in health, for instance. You know, I, I think um, myself, I, I I suffered for a long time uh, of endometriosis and adenomyosis. I've been really sick for many many years, and that's something that, for instance, again. In other studios, I really struggled uh, working because of that condition. Cartoon Saloon really always helped and understood that, yeah, it's an invisible handicap and that has to be dealt with. And I think that, yeah, a lot of people um, are really thankful for this. I think that's the future. That's where we have to go, really understand everybody's differences and needs. And I totally agree. And, you know, from a from someone who's a, a film critic, you know, in that sense of, of viewing a pro I mean, it can only enrich a product because the more people you bring on board to to tell their stories, to bring their perspective and their style to stories, the more people you're going to see. Because people, I always say people want to see themselves represented on screen. <laughs> and it's that they want to see themselves represented on screen because the more that they are represented on screen, the less people feel that they're different you know, or or the other, and and that's you know, it's just listening to what you say. I mean, it's it's correct. I mean, that's bringing more people on board and bringing different backgrounds. It will enrich the story that you're able yeah. to to bring to the big screen. I think that's that's really what uh, Cartoon Saloon uh, nailed uh, for so many years. Um, I I felt like when on Breadwinner really was incredible to feel. Oh, right. Like the fact that I'm a woman actually can help this project mm. um, a lot. And on Song of the Sea, the fact that I knew I knew a daughter of that age, I had a daughter of that age. And it was so it was so beautiful to actually put that, you know, I, my character, when I, anima I animated that character, it wasn't a stereotype of a six years old child. It was a six years old child because I could see her. I, I had her beside me. And yeah, that's that's really enriching. And as well, like going on in the future, yeah, the next projects you we will have, there is a, even there is even more representation of. And I'm and and it's beautiful because now you know I can sit back and say, okay, I don't know anything about this. I want somebody else to tell me how this thing has to be because I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not this person. I'm not this character. I cannot pretend to know this. What this character will feel. So please, I have to ask another person. What does this character feel in this moment? Because I cannot say, and I want to know, and that opens a conversation, and that's uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's absolutely. Look, look, Giovanni, you've been very gracious with your time mm -hmm. this evening. Now, as I've already mentioned earlier on, I usually have a habit of asking three questions when I'm trying to when I say I'm going to ask one, but I do have a a, a, a last few questions, and then I will yeah, let you sure. go back to your evening. Just generally, I mean working on. On the company, what does it feel like working at the minute with a company when the Irish film industry it just seems to be booming? I mean, we have a an Irish new wave of cinema. We've seen the success, mm. hopefully, at the Oscars. We've seen Cartoon Saloon with their success over the years. What's it like being being a part of that Irish new wave? It's, it's incredibly motivating. It's really motivating. It's it's refreshing, and it's 
it's crazy because this is such a small country. <laughs> and I, you know, I come from uh, from two big countries with a lot of people, a lot of noise, a lot of a lot of um, traffic, <laughs> and it's you know you have the feeling that really uh, Irish people have a way to have a, a need to express, a need to create that is innate, that is inside, and and it looks like you found a way to do it. And I don't know, I'm I'm almost external to this because I'm I'm not Irish. But one thing I, I can say is that I really appreciate, and I think it's part of it, um, the fact that Irish people in the industry are very open to external people. So they're not afraid of incorporating amazing French artists, Italian artists, uh, wherever they come from, artists, really, and not only Europeans. Um, there is a, a, a really an, a sense of... Um, exactly as I said before, of wanting to have the diversity in um, in order to create, because diversity really is uh, an incredible, incredible fertile asset. And I think that Irish people until now have been really open with this. I'm a bit afraid of what's going on now in Ireland. I have the feeling that certain type of uh, discourse about immigration and uh, it's starting to it's starting to sneak into the fabric of uh, society and that's that's what is dangerous for me because actually I think that all these achievements also come from an open mind like the the, the opening <laughs> the fact that your mind is so open towards others another culture and uh, you really have always been very very welcoming artistically and you need that. You need that. That's what makes uh, Ireland so special and so not self-referential and so open to and so 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 open to go abroad as well to to you know to to, to show to show them <laughs> the beauty of Ireland everywhere. It's um yeah it's a, it's a communication. It's a form of communication. It's it's uh, incredible. And I hope that it stays. Yeah, I mean, it's it is a depress it is a depressing thing. I mean, I think don't I don't just think that's something that's sadly reemerging just in Ireland. I think that does seem to be across Europe. There does seem to be that sense of of that kind of reemergence. And we we are a film show, so I mean, we will not allow ourselves to kind of go down into that too much too much. But I mean, you're you're totally right. I mean, in that sense, it is a depressing thing that that is still in 2023 beginning to reemerge. But I I, I want to go. I want to steer back to positive. Yeah. And absolutely. what I will do, I mean, just before we go, I mean, my last, I've, my second of my last three questions, just, you're going to be in Belfast, you are going to be talking, you're going to be talking to young people. And I guess since you will probably be mentioning this during your presentations, but if I could ask you now, what's your advice to those young people who might be listening to this, who might be coming to render, who might not get to render, but might well have listened to this, your advice to them starting out within the industry, looking back to yourself from your six-year-old self drawing, I mean, what's your advice to them now, 2023, you know, if they're thinking of pursuing a career within this? You've mentioned that it's changed. I mean, it's much less of... When I was listening to you talk earlier on, Giovanni, I was kind of thinking of the the old the, the six old isn't it the six old men of Disney? In that sense, <laughs> that very masculine. Kind of, it, it it seems to be changing. But your advice to those those young people who I look at myself, I'm forty. I was forty last year, and I mean not just from an animated point of view, but the whole attitude here in Northern Ireland, I feel towards the film industry has changed drastically. I know mm -hmm. when I went to university, I talked about wanting to do that. My my mother and my late father said, look, could you not do something that way we could see a, a, a more viable career path? I went and chose politics and this is where I am now. Let's not talk about, let's not pull on that thread. But I, I am very jealous. Just last week, I was at a at the Belfast campus talking to students and it's just so amazing to see that kind of that is seen as a viable career path and the kind of the passion they have. It's infectious. So I guess you're, you're just from for, for you now, as I ask your advice to those young people now. The biggest advice, the biggest advice I can give is really to not to worry too much about um, about what technologies will bring into our lives. Um, because 
and remember to be human and try to to really go into <clears throat> what it means to be a human so the more uh we try to dig into our subconscious into what if uh, into our fears into what is really happening inside us uh that thing that is in the guts you know that um, Maglifov, the scriptwriter of My Father's Dragon, calls it uh, lava. The lava, the lava, really. Try to go towards the lava because lava is something that human beings have to deal with every day, everywhere. And that's why we write movies. We we, we write books, we, we draw, we make art, we, we do music because we are afraid of dying, basically. that That's really it at the end of the day. We need a narrative. We build a narrative that makes us feel in control of things, you know. Um, that's it. That's really the the core of making art. Even if you're rigging a character, you're just doing that actually. So it doesn't. It, it, I know that the idea of AI, the idea of, of technology, can be scary. The moments where there is a you know there's a contraction in the market and people are laid off, horrible, scary, but temporary because we always will need that. And when human beings are around, stories are needed. And the more heartfelt, the more in the guts, the more profound you go, the better it is. So don't worry too much about um, about the surface of things. That's a nice sentiment. And my last question, just, you know, and I feel bad because I feel bad because it's a lovely way to end an interview, but I feel bad. But I have to ask, I mean, you've mentioned the projects you're working on. Are you able to tell us what you're working on? What are kind of some things you're working on that we will see in the future? I know My Father's Dragon is on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure about cartoon saloons. I know... Um, Wolf Walkers is on Apple TV, I believe. I'm not too sure about the availability of the breadwinner, but if you haven't seen it, just just buy it. Just buy it. You will not you will not be disappointed. Um, and Song of the Sea, etc. But what are the projects you have that you can tell us that you're working on? Right now, um, I'm working on um, Louise Bagnell's next movie. Uh, Louise uh, um, had an Oscar nomination for her short film uh, Late Afternoon a while ago. And uh, now she's uh, doing her first feature. And uh, I think it's been announced. So I can say it's, uh, it's the name is uh, Julian. And uh, and so, yeah, I'm storyboarding. I'm just starting right now. We are a very small team for now. So it's very, very cozy. <laughs> and she's, yeah, she's co-directing it with uh, other people. I'm not sure I can say everything about this yet. So. Okay. Uh, but it's gonna be awesome it's very interesting and uh, it's a very different thing and we th- i think i love cartoon saloon we all do different things every time it's a different thing <laughs> a completely different movie we um it's very beautiful because every time i get to do something completely different even if i'm in the same company with the same people <laughs> it's, it's very beautiful uh, and this time it's again a very different uh story told in a very different way and every everything will be it's still 2d animation though and uh, it's gonna be really beautiful okay fantastic well we have that to look forward to giovanna it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and hopefully we'll be able to maybe meet up in belfast when you're here and have a chat and for the festival and uh, i'm sure it'll be absolutely fantastic but thank you so much for your time this evening thank you thank you very much So that's my chat with Giovanna. Hopefully you enjoyed that. As we say, she's going to be here in Belfast on the 23rd and the 24th of February for full details of Render's lineup. And to book your tickets, check out its website. We have a link to that in our show notes for this episode. Hopefully you've enjoyed this recording on the next episode. I will be sticking with Render as I speak with visual effects artist Charmaine Chan, who is a very impressive CV within the film industry. She's worked on everything from Star Wars, Jurassic World, the Marvel movies to Transformers. So I really enjoyed chatting to her. You have that to look forward to. Be sure to subscribe to make sure you don't miss that episode. And if this is your first time listening to More Than Pixels on a Screen and you've enjoyed what you've listened to, be sure to check out the Bantaflix website where you can find the complete back catalogue of this podcast series. You can also find out about our NVTV show and keep up to speed with some of the events we do ourselves here in Belfast. So... Thank you once again for listening. That's all from me. I've been your host, Jim McLean. Thanks for listening to More Than Pixels on a Screen. Until the next time, goodbye.